Any other announcements? All right. Well, if there are no other announcements, we're going to move forward with our call to worship this morning. Holy, holy, holy. <coughs> yeah, please turn your hymnals to uh, hymn number two, Holy, Holy, Holy. It comes from Isaiah 6-3. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord's presence. <coughs> so let's please stand and sing the first and fourth verse. <coughs> Randy's not able to be with us this morning. Is that who's filling in for Randy? Anybody? You want me to? You are. All right. Well, I reckon I will. Um, Randy uh, told me yesterday that he uh, had something going on today, but uh, we've got many prayer requests, many that I hope that you are remembering daily. Um, we have had uh, uh, some losses that we've been made aware of over the last few weeks, but um, uh, we want to remember also uh, Brittany had a fall this week, and uh, and that's why she's not here today. We want to remember her and uh, and pray for her. Uh, do you have any specific requests or updates that you'd like to make us aware of? Ms. Donna. Um, our niece, Ashton White, she lives in Florence, but um, her granddaddy lives over in Chattanooga. She fell off a horse yesterday, hit her head. Mm. Ashton White, White. Fell, off a, fell off a horse and uh, a head injury. Pray for her. And she also has a bruised lung from that. Ooh. Any others? Yes, sir, Mr. L.G. Lawson. L.G. Lawson. Okay, well, we will remember the family of L.G. Lawson. Any others? <coughs> Well, we certainly will, Miss Laura. I pray for Miss Laura as she's having these, these tests done and <coughs> pray that God will help her through that. <coughs> Any others? Praise the Lord for that. Yes, Miss Tom. Um, just got a praise report on Mary Ashton. Um, she's expecting another baby in August, and we thought she was going to have to do blood uh, iron infusions for four weeks. And praise the Lord, she only had to have them two weeks and doing much better. So we're very thankful. Well, great. We will remember Mary Ashton and. Uh, like we've remembered so many that have had little ones over the past uh, couple of years in our church, we'll keep on lifting her up, and she she's a part of this church family. Yes, ma'am. Um, okay, I, I haven't been here for a while, so I don't know if Kelly's been here, but I'm sure I'm glad to see him here today. 
Amen. Amen. We always are praying for Mr. Kelly and, and uh, I visited with, with Hank Small this week. He's got to have uh, some more uh, surgery in July. Uh, uh, so pray, pray for him. Any others? All right, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful to you this morning uh, for all of the blessings that you send our way. Uh, Father, we're thankful that we can come before uh, your throne of grace with our every need, with our every care and every concern. In fact, your word uh, commands that we pray uh, without ceasing, that we're all in all things we pray. Uh, Father, I pray this morning for... Uh, these many that are on our prayer list that have been made mention of specifically as well. And, uh, Father, we pray for your hand of healing, your hand of guidance, your hand of grace to be present in each situation and circumstance. Father, as we saw in Sunday school this morning, uh, our circumstances uh, don't need to dictate our response uh, to those things. Father, how thankful we are that no matter what it is that we face, uh, you are constantly in control, that you're never out of control. Father, we pray that you'd help us to glorify your name through all that we do and all that we say. Uh, Father, uh, again, lift up these men who are uh, hurting in need of your help, and we'll praise you for all that you accomplish. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't believe we have any lyrics on the screen this morning, so make sure you turn your hymns to page 206. That's page number 206. Uh, our offertory comes from Philippians 2.9. God gave him the name that is above every name. So let's please stand and sing. We're going to sing the first, second, and fourth verse of Blessed Be the Name. Please stand and sing. <laughs>
other people first. Patience, which we don't have a ton of around our house lately, is to make sure that we're waiting, right? For Jesus Christ and taking us first. And so what God is saying, he said, clothe yourself. And that is just like when you jump on, jump up out of bed and you tuck your socks off, you pull them on, just like you would put your clothes on every day. You should be putting those things on if you're part of God's people, God's so when you slide your clothes on in the morning, I want you to think about that and be kind and to show compassion, right? And humility. Think of other people more than ourselves. All right. All right, let's pray together, okay? Ready? Jesus, I thank you so much um, for these moments together, Lord, and I thank you for the reminder that as your chosen ourselves, we're to put these things on every day. Not like clothes that we wear, God, but as a reminder for these little kids of it, just as often as we put our clothes on and get ready for a day, we should put these things on as well, to show compassion to one another, to be humble, Lord, to live a life that reflects you. I pray you remind us of that this week. In Jesus' name, you turn with me in your Bibles this morning to Galatians chapter 1, Galatians chapter 1, and we're going to start a series through the book of Galatians. I think this is uh, one of the best ways of, of studying the Bible. It's certainly one of the best ways of, of, uh, of 
preaching the scripture is to look at entire books of scripture. Uh, Galatians is a doctrinal uh, treatise of sorts, and Paul is writing uh, to the church at Galatia, which he had uh, uh, founded. He had uh, been at Galatia uh, in previous years, and this letter that we identify ourselves uh, and what we believe uh, through the doctrine that we cling to. And this is one of the reasons that I love the Baptist faith and message is because I believe it's the most comprehensive, one of the, the most uh, doctrinally sound confessions of faith that exists in our world today. We live in a world that is departing from truth, trying to, to impress upon the gospel, trying to impress upon the word of God what the culture says is right and what is good. And we are called to be people of the book. We're called to be people of Scripture, people who found everything they believe and measure everything they think or believe by the Word of God. His Word is our standard. His Word is pure, it is perfect, it is good, and we are called to obey it. Doctrine is important. It is essential. And one of the things that you find out about Paul in this letter is that doctrine mattered more than man's opinion. You find him very clearly making the case for the fact that doctrine, a right understanding of God and the gospel, is more important than the opinion of other people. God's word calls upon us to challenge accepted norms in the culture, doesn't it? What we find true in the scripture is that God confronts the brokenness that we live in and cling to in many ways. And God's word causes us to see the brokenness of the world system. And Paul reminds the Galatians, he writes to challenge them and and undermine this movement that was happening. Calling them back to grace. Calling them back to the gospel that he had preached. He had labored in, in Galatia. He had seen these churches 
founded and now a sect of people have moved in seeking to undermine the foundation of the church and not only undermine the foundation of the gospel that Paul preached, but to undermine the apostleship of the apostle Paul. Paul declares to the Galatians that doctrine is more important than the opinions of man. He tells them very clearly that revelation the special, God's special revelation. Theologically, that's what this book is. It's special revelation. It is God's word given to us, uniquely given to us. That revelation is more important than human perspective and speculation. That God's word is what's important. The false teaching that was being spread in the Galatian churches by people who claimed authority from Jerusalem... They were endeavoring to place Gentile Christians in Galatia under the bondage of the law. Now understand me. The law is important. The law of God is, is established in the Old Testament. The law is important. Jesus said not one jot or tittle of the law will pass away. The law is important. Romans, tell, Romans 5 tells us why it's important. The law entered that the offense might abound. The law exists to... To highlight, to put a spotlight on the brokenness of humanity and our incapability to meet the standard of God. The law entered that the offense might abound, but grace entered that where sin abounded, grace might much more abound. They claimed this false authority. They sought to tangle these new believers in the legalism of the law. They were telling them unless, that unless they did certain things, unless they followed a certain pattern that was rooted in the, the tradition of, uh, of the Jewish religion, that they could not please God, that they couldn't know God. <coughs> unless they did these certain things, they couldn't be saved. One thing in particular that they were telling them that they needed to do was to be Circumcised. They told them that they needed to take that mark upon themselves as God has had ordered the uh, children of Israel to do in, in the Old Testament. And Paul's telling them that no, these outward marks on the body don't matter a lick, but what is inside your heart is what matters. Listen to what Martin Luther said about the book of Galatians. He said, it is the most profound, condensed, and powerful argument ever expressed in writing. The epistle of Galatians is my epistle. I have betrothed myself to it. He says it is, it, it's a condensed, it's not as long as Romans, which is probably Paul's most famous doctrinal treatise, but it is a condensed doctrinal letter seeking to correct errors. That were happening. These false teachers sought to substitute external badges for inward faith. And there is no substitution. He sought, they sought to bind these believers up. Leading them away from what we know is supposed to be Christian freedom. These are things that we struggle against today. Every one of us has been tempted at some point in time or another to believe that our salvation is based upon our walking up to the front of the church at some point in time in our life, our being dunked in the baptismal pool. Those things are important. We're baptized to be obedient to the, the example of Jesus Christ. But those external signs are nothing if there is not inward conversion, if there is not inward transformation. That's an essential part of what Paul was saying. And in chapter 1, we don't see Paul jumping to his own defense immediately, but we see Paul immediately defending the gospel of grace that he preached. A salvation based upon nothing but Jesus. And he begins in verse 1, and if you found your place in God's word, follow along with me. 
He says, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who has raised him from the dead and all the brethren who are with me. To the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be glory forever and ever Amen. And listen, after he gives that introduction, after he gives that, that uh, welcome to them, he goes straight to the point. He says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another gospel. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven, listen to his words, but even if we, if I myself, the Apostle Paul, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be a curse. Let him be anathema is the word from the Greek. Let him be a curse. He says, let those who preach a gospel that clings to anything but Jesus be a curse. As we've said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. And I love this statement in verse 10, and I've often looked back at it. For do I now seek to persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. He says, God has not called me to, to, to preach so that I can please people, so that I can be a people pleaser. He says, God has called me to preach the gospel, which is an uncomfortable truth. The gospel is naturally offensive to broken and sinful man because it tells us that we are fundamentally broken because of sin. And the only answer to that problem is, is Jesus. Do I seek to persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be the bondservant of Christ. Paul writes this letter. He declares himself to be an apostle. He says, my apostleship isn't founded on any dude sitting in Jerusalem. It's not on the apostle Peter. And that's one, one argument that Peter never was a pope of anything. He says, it's not founded on the authority of Peter or any other of the apostles. My calling has come directly from God, and the gospel that I preach is not of man's wisdom, but what God has revealed to me. Paul writes to this people, and he immediately associates himself with the gospel of grace. And he tells the Galatians, in, and, and through uh, this uh, uh, letter, uh, there are over 40 references to the person of Jesus Christ. Over 40 times, Paul emphasizes the person and work of Jesus Christ because that is the foundation of everything that he believed and preached. When, when Jesus asks his disciples just before the uh, uh, transfiguration, he says, who do you say that I am? Who do men say that I am? And they answered. He said, who do you say that I am? And Peter speaks up and he says, surely you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. He says, I'll call you Cephas, which means a little stone. But upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He wasn't saying anything about founding the church on, on Peter. He says the truth that Peter professed was the foundation of the church. That he is the Christ, the son of the living God. Paul emphasizes that truth by highlighting the person and work of Jesus Christ. The Judaizers had come in. You see uh, throughout this letter, uh, he, he tells them in chapter 3, and we learn that uh, that they were trying to undermine Paul's apostleship. The message uh, they were bringing was not uh, uh, trustworthy. Uh, 
uh, and they, they sought to, to call Paul an untr untrustworthy messenger. They declared that their credentials came from Peter, but their credentials were nothing. Paul's gospel was centered in Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection, not in Moses, not in the law, but Jesus. He preached that the gospel is all that can bring peace. It's the gospel of grace. It's a gospel of liberty, a freedom from the power of and oppression of sin. You see that in verse 4. He says that he might deliver us from this present evil age. To deliver through. To bring out of. He is not looking. God is not looking to bind us up in brand new chains. When he's freed us from the chains of sin. He has given us freedom and liberty. In Jesus Christ. Paul starts his letter. And he ends his letter with Praise to God. Martin Luther wrote later on as Paul visited the churches in Galatia that he taught them the pure doctrine of the gospel. Gospel appears over and over again in the pages of the New Testament. We see it time and time again throughout every letter that Paul wrote. We see him mention the gospel. The gospel uh, is mentioned no less than 12 times in the book of Galatians. The first two chapters of this book are personal. You see Paul's personal conviction, his personal experience with the gospel. Ten times in 45 verses, you see Paul highlight not his own apostleship, but the gospel that he preached. He tells us that the gospel is good news. That it's the only news that can bring peace between us and God. Gospel means good news. We, when we think about a verse of the scripture that summarizes the gospel, often we think about John 3.16. That God gave us his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. When we think about the gospel, our mind should go directly to Jesus. My salvation is not rooted in my baptism. It's not rooted in my walking forward and speaking to a pastor. Those things are important. But they're not salvation. Salvation is in confessing as Romans 10, 9 and 10 tells us confessing with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believing in our heart that God has raised him from the dead and we shall be saved. It's what we know and what we believe and how we're transformed by the gospel. He tells us that it's good news because it's the news of salvation, that it is pardon for sin. It's purity where there was only filth and dirt of sin. It's peace with God. It's power to live. And the gospel has paradise for its future. It's the only way to heaven. It's a free offer. We often sing amazing grace and we forget the meaning of those words. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. What is grace? If someone walked up to you today and said, what does it mean, this word grace? Unmerited, undeserved favor from God. That's what grace is. It's God giving us something beautiful and wonderful rather than what we deserve and what he gives us in salvation is not founded on anything that I've done, but every bit of it is because of who Jesus is and what he has done. The gospel is God's good news to mankind. It's the best news that mankind has ever received. 
that there is pardon from sin. That there is peace to be had with God. And the only true gospel, and this is important, there are many false gospels floating around in the world today. There are many religious sects out there that have established themselves and on, on the belief of a false gospel. I think about Jehovah's Witnesses. I think about the Mormons, both works-based religions. Both of them... Both, both of them declaring that our standing with God is based upon what we do. We can see the ritualism that exists in the world around us. The religious world around us. That we're, we're only saved if we receive certain rites or are part of certain ceremonies or are baptized in this way, confirmed or circumcised as Paul was dealing with in this time. We see rationalism seeping into the church. So what's rationalism? It's the substitution of, of God's truth for man's opinion. We see that in, in the modern movement of Christianity. This, this effort to, to uh, appeal to the culture rather than being the thing that sets itself apart from the culture. It's, it, it all denies the authority of God's word. It undermines the, the position of the scripture and it ultimately substitutes our works for the gospel of salvation. Paul makes it clear to the Galatians that the gospel is true not because it was declared to be true by him. He says the gospel is true because it is not conceived by man. He says God revealed the gospel to me. He speaks very forcefully in condemning any other gospel. He says let him be accursed who preaches to you this message that you have to be bound up in legalism to be in right standing with God. Galatians gives us a clear view of where Paul got his start. If you look at verse 11, he says, But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. How was it that God revealed the truth of the gospel to Paul, then called Saul? The Bible says that Jesus appeared on the road to Damascus and blinded a man who was so zealous in persecuting the church. He held the coats of those who stoned uh, Stephen. He was looking to destroy the church, but God met him on the road to Damascus. He said, I didn't come to Jesus because of the work of any other apostle. I didn't come to Jesus because of, of, of uh, going through some, the motions of some kind of, of ritual. He says, I came to Jesus because Jesus came to me. He says, you've heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately listen to this. He says, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia. He says, I went to the desert and I wrestled with my faith. Paul didn't deal with other individuals. He dealt with the word, he dealt with the word of God and the Holy Spirit of God. He went and he separated himself from other people so that nothing could pollute the gospel that he believed and he preached. He says, I stayed in the desert 
and returned again to Jerusalem after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter. And I remained with him for 15 days, but I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now concerning the things I write to you indeed before God, I do not lie. Afterward, I went to the regions of Syria and Cilicia, Cilicia. And I was unknown by the face of the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they were hearing only that he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God in me. He says, I don't come to you with credentials from Jerusalem or anybody else. I come to you with credentials from God, the Father, and his son, Jesus Christ. Paul shines a light on the importance of knowing what we believe and why we believe it. And the first place that we have to start is salvation. How is it that a man or woman can be saved? He makes it very clear. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus alone. That is all that God will accept. Faith alone, in Jesus alone alone he says I'm not giving you a message that you want to hear I'm not going to come and, and, and pacify your broken ideologies he, he writes and he says I write to you to correct that you can depart from the brokenness that seeks to draw you away from God I make known to you brethren that the gospel which I preach, which was preached by me, is not according to man. We are tempted as human beings often to base our standing with God on how good we think we've been or on the stuff we've done. And Paul says no. He says you can do as much as you think you can to try and gain favor, it won't work. The only thing that God accepts, the only thing that will bring that freedom, that joy, that liveliness to the Christian life is to know Jesus and be changed by him. The Pharisees were doing what the people, what the Judaizers were trying to do to the Galatian people and, and Jesus condemned them. He says you wear your, your robes with, their, with your tassels. He says you uh, broaden your phylacteries. You, you wear your, your headdress and all of these things. He says you love to sit at the, at the head of the table. He says and, and all the while you are whitewashed tombs full of dead men's bones. Looks good from the outside but inside rotten as it can be. Jesus addressed it, Paul addresses it, that nothing but the gospel and the change that the gospel brings is good enough. Paul was a man who was transformed by grace, transformed by the gospel. A man who once sought to destroy the church is now preaching the gospel he tried to snuff out. And the entire time, he is constantly declaring his insufficiency and God's sufficiency. Paul challenges us, and I hope that what he writes here challenges each of our hearts. That we should know without a shadow of a doubt what we believe and why we believe it. We should know without a shadow of a doubt whether our salvation is the real thing. If you're here today or you've got family members that have a hope so salvation, you need to help them get to a no so salvation. This isn't something that we should guess about. It's something that we shouldn't, shouldn't leave up to chance. Jesus made it clear, Paul made it clear that we can know that we belong to him. We can know in whom we believe. And have confidence in what he is able to do. Faith alone.
by grace alone, in Jesus alone, is all that God will accept. And it is all that he approves. Gospel changes an individual. There's no way that you can come into contact with the gospel of Jesus Christ, come to know the, the God of this universe and not be changed in some way by it. I think about the story of the demoniac of Gadaree. You remember that story? The demoniac of Gadaree, he, he lived in a cave. He cut himself. He was possessed by demons, the Bible says. And when Jesus came uh, uh, there into the, the region of Gadaree, the Bible says that there was a large herd of swine that were feeding near the mountains. And, and this demoniac came out. The demons knew who he was. Why do you come and, and uh, torture us, they said. And Jesus commanded them, out of the man. And the Bible says that they went into the swine and the swine immediately ran down a steep place into the sea, some 2,000. And the scripture says that the demon-possessed man, the formerly demon-possessed man who called himself a legion, he sat and clothed he sat down with Jesus he, and clothed himself. He was in his right mind. Listen to what verse 16 of Mark chapter 5 says. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon possessed and about the swine. And they began to plead with him to depart from their region. The people wanted Jesus to get out because of the destruction he had brought upon these demons that possessed this man. But listen to what happened to the man. The demoniac of Gadaree, now cleansed and, and whole. He, as Jesus was getting into the boat, begged Jesus that he might go with him. But Jesus did not permit, permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them the great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And the Bible says the demoniac departed and began to proclaim in uh, the, the Decapolis and all the surrounding region what Jesus had done for him and all marveled. That's what a life transformed by Jesus is supposed to look like. The man wanted to stay with Jesus, but Jesus said, no, you go and you tell Everyone about the grace, the favor that has been poured out upon you. The gospel changes an individual. It motivates us to take it to the world. We want to see other people change by it. And I'm thankful that it is a gospel for all people. In chapter 2, verse 6, I love how harsh Paul, Paul was not easy on the Galatians in this book he said but from those who seem to be something whatever they were it makes no difference to me but God shows no personal favoritism to any man for those who seem to be something added nothing to me Paul said I don't care who you think you are I don't care who you think you are what you think you're entitled to or what you think you've done to gain God's favor and given yourself such authority in the church. He said, you haven't added a thing to me. And every one of those who seem to be something makes no difference to me. Peter said it very well too. That God is no respecter of persons. The gospel is for all people, no matter who you are, where you come from. It's for us. And it's a gospel of freedom. It's a gospel of grace. It's a gospel of hope. I want you to bow your heads with me. Father, all around us in our world today, there are many who don't have the hope of the gospel. 
Father, there may be some sitting in this place this morning that don't know the freedom of the gospel. Father, we know that out in the world around us there are many who don't know the freedom of the gospel but base their standing with you on something they've done or something they're mother or father or grandparents have done. Father, help us today to realize the uselessness of these things and help us to know your grace, to know the power of your salvation, that you alone are the giver of salvation, that you sent your son into the world for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Father, help us to live out Romans 10, 9 and 10. That if we confess with our mouths the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that you have raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. Father, help us to believe the good news of the gospel and help us to live it outside the, the doors of this church, outside the four walls of our homes. Father, help us to be a people who shine our light, who put, it, who put that light on a lampstand so that it can shine on everything around it. Father, help us to be the kinds of believers that we see reflected in the pages of the New Testament. Willing to step outside of comfort zones. Willing to extend grace where there is no grace extended in return. Help us to be declarers of truth in a world that desperately needs it. And help us to know that our salvation isn't based on anything other than the person and work of Jesus Christ. Who He is and what He has done through the cross of Calvary and his resurrection early on the third day. Grace alone. Faith alone. In Jesus alone. Thank you for grace. Thank you for unmerited, undeserved favor. We'll praise you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to have a short time of invitation. I hear the bell tolling. We I'm going to challenge you this morning. If, if this is something you wrestle with, get it right, get it settled today. But if we're not taking a God, that gospel, if, if you're here today and you know without a shadow of a doubt that your faith isn't founded on being dunked in that baptistry or praying at this altar, then take the gospel that God has given to you. And Paul tells the Galatians, he says, this is a treasure that has been entrusted to you. Take it to the world. Take it to your workplace. Believe it and live it as we sing. Hymn number 320, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Hymn number 320. Oh, so. minds across this room. There 
we ourselves need to be changed by you. Father, we believe that just as you met uh, the Apostle Paul on that road to Damascus, you are still meeting people where they are. You can do it all by yourself, but how thankful we are that you use human influence. Lord, I pray that we would allow ourselves to be instruments in your hands to share the good news of Jesus Christ, to prepare hearts and minds to receive that good news, to help the folks we come in contact every day to understand that they don't have to have a hope so salvation. That's not salvation at all. But we can have a salvation founded upon the person and work of Jesus Christ plus nothing else. It's all you accept. It's you. Father, help us to go out into this world today and be salt and light. Help us to seek not to be pleasers of men, as Paul said, but to seek to please you above all other things. And sometimes that means standing for truth. Father, give each and every one.